Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity of coming back to Austin uh, one more time. Uh, when I first uh, was invited to Austin about three years ago, I think, at this particular point, um, I was sitting in a hotel room looking out, and I thought, boy, this looks pretty familiar, uh, being from Portland, Oregon, and being, uh, as, as you know, in all the uh, best lists, Portland and Austin are always competing for some position very close to the top. And what hit me was that uh, Austin uh, is very much like Portland, except for one thing. It didn't seem to have a real urban sense about it. It had the projects, it had the buildings, it had the institutions. But kind of that juice that is part of an urban situation was not quite there yet. So I began to look at, at Austin and relate it back to experiences of, of uh, the time I have spent in, in Portland and other cities about how a city evolves and how you move, move forward in, in certain areas. And realizing that um, what, what could be in Austin uh, is really pretty fantastic. And you all in this room are a part of that. Now, I put together my presentation this morning as, as kind of a report, and I expect to step on a lot of toes this morning. So, um, as I've told others, the public flogging is scheduled for outside later on. But uh, uh, for those of you that used to break into a cold sweat when you had to go to math class, this is the formula that we're going to uh, follow today as we go through this presentation. Our work today is dealing with the main street of Texas. And the methodology we used was this formula, an audit of going through and talking to, to folks, uh, adding observations to that that came out of that, those discussions. And then multiplying that times experience of things that I had seen in other cities or things that we know about urban situations and, and, and how cities evolve. And that hopefully will give us some future directions. So let's start with the audit itself. And we have many folks in this room that I had the opportunity to, to meet with uh, that came through my hotel room. That probably isn't the best way to put it, but um, came through the uh, governor's suite upstairs and spent some time with me uh, talking about things. And we had 36 different meetings over a two-week period uh, in July, um, with about one to four individuals per meeting. And we had three group meetings, uh, group groups with people talking about different, different parts of this. And in the end, I had contact with over 100 individuals, the stakeholders of, of, of Austin. And many of you are in this room today, and I want to thank you for spending the time with me and, and for sharing your insights as, as we went forward. So through those conversations, um, for those of you that weren't there, we had three basic questions that we asked uh, the group or the, in, in each meeting. What is right, what is wrong, and what should be the future direction? What is right about Congress? What is wrong about Congress? And what are the future directions that we should follow on Congress itself? And so what I heard I'm going to deliver is kind of a state of the state of Congress. And I'm going to talk about the state of wrongness, and I'm going to talk about the state of rightness. And the reason I'm going to do that is that because of my work in competitions and design evaluations throughout the nation and, and internationally, I found that juries and others, in order to make evaluations of certain situations, uh, there's something inherent within us where we have to look at what's wrong with it before we can see what's right with it. And it's the way we, we evaluate things. Now, even though I preach this to my juries to not look at it this way, I'm going to go against my own um, 
recommendations and speak about it first about the state of wrongness. They uh, inevitably everybody that came into the room when I asked what the what the problems were, the prominent issues were three: parking, the homeless, and the buses. And I think that's that those are all issues that need to be dealt with, but they need to be dealt with on a larger systemic uh, basis of how, how you do things. And some of the things I'm going to show you today begin to speak to, to the, those issues. There was concerns about the development entitlement process, that it was, it was unpredictable, it was a bit confusing, and most of all it was time consuming. People were looking at somewhere between 12 to 15 months minimum to be able to get through their entitlements for, for new development. Now those of you that are developers in the room know that we go through economic swings and, and sign curves about when we're up and when we're down, when financing's available and when it isn't, isn't available. Well, if it takes you 15 months to go through an entitlement process, that's a third of the way through the next recession cycle. And you're, you're, the whole market is changing, everything is changing, so you need to have answers quicker and um, know what the um, predictability of any particular development is. There was acknowledgement of many, many initiatives for improvement. We saw, we saw those today from, from Daniel and the successes that have been had here. But the uh, sense is, is that they're kind of independent and not necessarily coordinated, very diffused. And it's difficult for someone on the street to understand the relativity and relationship of how these different pieces come together. There is acknowledgement that there is a vision for Congress Avenue, but there is, I think, confusion as to what the identity of Congress is. In essence, in essence Daniel even mentioned the branding of, of Congress. And I think there is confusion as to the role of Congress as a location within the city and what it needs to do, not just as a street, but as a part of the greater downtown. So let's move to the more positive side of things and, and the state of rightness. There was a clear endorsement that came out of these conversations that Congress is far more improved than it was five years ago. You all have done excellent work and you, you have begun to evolve the, the Congress in a very positive direction. In looking around and talking to people, I saw that there's an amazing amount of development potential around Congress. You aren't sealed in. You really have a number of opportunities, not only on the street itself, but in the, in the blocks surrounding. I was struck, truly struck and impressed with the vision of all of you that came to see me for your individual properties. Uh, there are, and, and I won't uh, belay your, your uh, betray your confidences in kind of saying exactly what those, what those are um, and the, the payoff for not doing that, I'll take on the side over here. Uh, but uh, uh, if, if we were able to realize half of the vision that, was, that I was party to the hearing, uh, this would be a fantastic street. And of course, the last one, which you all know, I can't explain, but I know it's there, is this kind of fierce independence that you all have, both as Texans and as Austinites. Um, that is uh, a rightness, it is a power, and it's a bit of a problem. So these are my observations. I think the wrongness that I saw where well, there's too much of me, not enough we. And the rightness is that there is a transformation underway. It has started. So let's go back to our basic formula. And we'll now start, what does experience teach us? And so in this particular section, I wanted to talk about not only what I heard, but what I heard and how that informed me in moving, moving forward, mixing it with experiences that I had seen or, or been involved with in other cities. I think we all need to understand, and we, we all do, I think, the evolving natures of downtown. 
Downtowns are never finished. They're never complete. They're always moving. They're always churning as we go, we go forward. But a good downtown, a, good, a great city, has a great downtown, has a great street. And that's what Congress is. If we can make Congress a great street, we can have a great downtown, we can have a great, great city or a greater city. Secondly, I think that's this role of Congress, and I, I really not only searched um, and, and asked people about this, but thought a lot about it myself, about what is the role of Congress Avenue in, as a building block of the downtown. And I think it should be the civic focus of downtown. Now, these little diagrams that you see up there are, are I think, ind indicative of of some of the different approaches to how you might approach Congress. If you're looking at it as a backbone or trunk, then the branches that go off it begin to define how the form of the city works off of that or how that is, that is implied or emphasized. If it is a retail street, it's a completely different configuration. It is basically lining, lining a street with retail kinds, kinds of activities. And to me, the thing that is, is missing is this ceremonial part of, of Congress itself. Uh, we have a view corridor, we have a capital at the end of, on, on one end, you look back the other way, and, and an evolving part of, of, um, of the downtown is, is becoming evident. But this idea of a ceremonial street, the main street of Texas, the street that moves up to the capital, it is missing. Think of those great streets that are kind of axial, um, the Champs-Élysées, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. Those kinds of streets, that's missing on Congress. So I began to think about how Congress operates. And, and I think what, as we move forward, we need to think about the construct of, of Congress. Congress can't do everything for everybody. You can't shove everything you want into one street. There are systems within the, the city that have to impact further out. So I propose that we start thinking about Congress not as a street, but as a corridor. So you start thinking about from Colorado to Brazos and how the different systems as they're allocated across that area, whether it be transportation, whether it be parking, whether it be retail, those, those begin to look through the entire corridor. And then another thing that is in this diagram that I want to point out that we, we spoke to in our individual meetings is we have taken now Congress uh, to the south to go over the bridge and move towards Riverside and, and Soco. And what happens on the other side, on the south side of, of the lake, uh, will take a different configuration than this very strict grid that we see on the north, north side of the lake as, as it evolves, as the uses change over as they, as they move. But the idea of the corridor. I also sat and looked at it a long time, and thanks to, to George allowing me to be up in the, in the governor's suite, um, I could see from one end to the other. And as we spoke to the various stakeholders that, that came in, um, I realized that it isn't the same all the way down. That there are different parts of the street which have different kinds of character. And maybe we're pushing too much if we're trying to get everything to be the same. Maybe we should accept this kind of unique character overlap and celebrate it. So in our thinking about where we put retail or where we, where we ask for certain kinds of uses or even how we might define this, the sidewalks and streets, maybe we should think a little bit more about almost neighborhoods or pieces of this as they go together and think about the interaction between them. So in my little scratchy sketch here, um, by the way, I still draw. Uh, even though uh, most architects can do it on computers, I can't. I'm challenged by email. Um, 
that in the very north, I think there is a capital sector. And I'm going to come back to this, this later on. But I think there's an opportunity up there to develop something very special. There seems to be an arts and culture area uh, that is developed and continues to develop with the contemporary, with the theaters, uh, between about uh, 7th and 9th. There is this retail, this mixed use area that in many uh, places is, is built out, in other places there's a lot of missing teeth. And this seems to be the place where some of the retail's going, um, where uh, more office, commerce, and some institutional issues, or some institutional uh, uh, ideas in there, um, especially the Mexican Museum on, on Fifth. Second becomes a real crossroads. And I think we're seeing this right now with the JW Marriott sprouting out. Uh, but the axial relationship between the convention center going across second to City Hall to the new library through the retail area, second becomes a real crossroads in, in the overall development of the, of the city itself. Uh, as Sinclair Black has done and, and others have, have proposed, I believe the bridge should be more than a piece of infrastructure. I think it should really be the link between the north and the south. I think there should be bridgeheads of some sort that really give it character and substantial part of it. And I think there is a tremendous opportunity and, and some of the property owners shared with me their, their plans in a place I'm going to call the South Waterfront. It is important, I believe, to think about the systems that make up a city and that make up a street. And, and when making our planning decisions, we have to understand the way that these systems interact. So what might be the best situation for transit may not be the best situation for retail. Or there may be uh, institutional needs, individual pockets that need to tie into a larger context or not larger fabric of what it is. So I think that this understanding of what systems operate and take the, take the street apart systemically as to what's needed for pedestrian movements, what's needed for vehicular movements, what's in, uh, needed for transit, what's needed for the uses to support the uses that, that are along the side. And as we all know, we need to respect kind of the architectural DNA or ar archaeological DNA of, of the, of the, the um, corridor. Uh, first of all, I want everybody to kind of think about streets and what streets really are. Well, they're outside rooms. They're outdoor rooms. They have walls that are the building faces that define them. They have a floor that is a combination of streets and sidewalks and, and movement uh, areas. And then you have a ceiling, which is usually the sky or might be the tree, the tree canopy. But think about the room in the same way you might think about this room, or you might think about your living room. It has to take a whole lot of different functions, from gathering, celebration, to eating, to whatever, or watching TV, those kinds of things. And the street is the same way. It has to accommodate a whole lot of different functions. It has to be flexible. It has to allow that flexibility and, and use over time itself. I, when I begin to look at the way the downtown has, has evolved and is evolving, I see pockets of things that are occurring throughout the downtown. Waller Creek is a good example, uh, Whole Foods. Um, and what becomes a part of making all those things come together is an idea of east-west connectivity. How do we connect those various pieces of the city across from east to west, and how do we make those come together? And the last thing I'd like to say in this particular area, and the little diagrams begin, begin to show this, is that there's that very strange Austin way of dividing land that has been here historically, in that you have these skinny little lots of 63 feet, and I think they have depths of 185, 190 feet, well, which is an interesting little piece of real estate. 
But when you think about putting new uses into there and contemporary needs for those uses, it becomes rather difficult. So the second diagram over uh, shows um, retail. Well, retail likes certain depths. They don't like to go much, much beyond that, and they only want to pay for what that particular depth is. 85 feet is stretching the retailers. A lot of them like 60, 65, 70 feet. So if you have 85 feet and you're able to sell that, you have another 85 feet on the back part of your lot that you, or your building that you really don't uh, have, a, have a use for. And especially if it's in the middle of the block, how do you get people by the retailer to use that, that spot and back? And then what is it take the third diagram, if we, uh, we have enacted this um, uh, setback for the capital view corridor, so above 90 feet, uh, you have to step back the 90 feet, or excuse me, above, yeah, above 90 feet, you have to step back 60, 60, okay. Uh, 60 on one side and 40 on the other. Okay, got it, okay. Um, the, um, so my diagram's wrong, sorry about that. Uh, but, but what that does mean is that uh, even if you, if you take back the, the, the 60 feet, then you have a 130 feet by 60 foot um, area up there for a floor plate, which isn't enough for a sellable floor plate in just about any use, except potentially some, some housing or something like that. But if that piece of land isn't on a corner, so you can get side light access to it, then you're faced with a very tight uh, development situation. Now, what I'm suggesting is I think uh, we ought to go back uh, and, and look at zoning particularly in the corridor itself. And how can the zoning be improved to identify specific issues that are, de that are there because of the um, uh, traditional way that land is divided? And how can we bring back better development potential by looking at how the zoning can, can accommodate that. I think that, as I mentioned before, there's this idea of a lot of things going on in the downtown. So this idea of connections and connectivity become very important as far as weaving these different pieces into the evolving structure of what the downtown is. And if I go back to my Portland experience, the one thing that, that made Portland work, public-private partnerships. Um, this has now become, you know, people call them three Ps, whatever else. But basically what it is, it's about we. That we collectively, whether we are an institution, whether we are a government, whether we are a private developer, whether we are a citizen, the we trumps many, many me's. Some of these developments have, have started, or some of these relationships have started to develop. People have to get out of their silos. People have to get out of their silos, whether it's a department in the city, whether it's a landowner down the street. You have to get out of there and begin to think about what the collective we can, can deliver in putting the, the projects together. So back to the methodology of our A plus OE function of D, or the future direction of Congress Avenue. What I'm proposing to you right now is just some big ideas. And I'm not going to take full uh, credit for these because I think in my discussions with you all, these all began to surface from one way or another. I may have put some, some meat around them and some structure around them, but uh, these, I think, really came from our discussions. I want you to look around the corner, not just focus on Congress, but looking at the streets that come into Congress and how they intersect. Because as those streets begin to develop certain functions connecting different uses together, then they develop a certain character. And when they intersect with Congress, that intersection is informed by how the streets are acting coming into them. So if they're strictly circulation streets, that has a certain impact. If retail is starting to bleed up those, it's a different kind of impact. If it's Sixth Street, it's a completely different kind of, kind of impact. But make, see how th those particular areas work. 
Secondly, I think we have to think about each system. Again, the systemic way of, think, of taking apart the street, of taking apart the corridor, and thinking about how these systems work together. So all transit does not have to be on Congress. Transit can be outside. Uh, there is uh, thought from, from many of our retail experts that sometimes transit and retail on the same street are not the right approach. What transit does is get people to the retail, but it shouldn't necessarily front the retail because you want that street to be active and, and the retail working. And I think, uh, since everybody walked here today and didn't drive cars, there really needs to be, as, as Daniel says, there really needs to be an overall parking strategy for the downtown. There's tons of parking, tons of parking in private buildings. The other parking is, is in lots. Those lots are going away. If you look out to the southwest, there are three or four cranes out there right now of new development that's going on, most of which is, is uh, going on former parking lots. So I think there needs to be an overall strategy developed which allows for short-term parking, uh, in and out kinds of, of, of parking in, in uh, accessible garages, uh, people that can come in and park, or they're going to work here all day. But both of these should, or these should be both public and private initiatives. It doesn't necessarily have to be one or the other, but there should be public parking garages as well as, as a part of all this. And more important than anything, I think the user of the downtown, the occupant of the downtown, should have choice. Um, that whether they want to go into a short-term garage, long-term garage, or what, what their particular use is. Second, I think the thing that is, <coughs> that is missing in, on Austin and Congress is this space for civic celebration. You have the stroll, you have other kinds of activities. There is no public square in Austin. No public square. You know, every great city needs a living room. Every great city needs a place um, where there can be uh, civic celebrations. This is a place when someone comes back from a war that they're, they're greeted. This is where the parade takes place. This is the place that, that might have a political demonstration. This is the place that um, might be a place for civic, civic celebration. Uh, might be the place for a two-day miniature golf course. Who knows? I mean, some, something that could occur on a, a civic square. I think there's a tremendous opportunity, and this isn't, isn't uh, uh, new with me. I know these discussions have, have taken place over time. There is the space up between uh, 11th and 10th uh, to the west of Congress, uh, where the governor's mansion is, where the bakery is, there's a parking lot, a, uh, a not very nice park at this particular point that really need, need to be evolved and I think is the opportunity for this civic space, for the city square of Austin. To the east of, of Congress, there's also state-owned areas and there's an, um, the block that is the little uh, uh, small, small lot that is at the corner at the, at the southeast corner of 11th and Congress might be development of a, um, uh, by a private, private developer that could put money into the other development. So I think there's an opportunity up there for a unique kind of partnership between the state, the city, and private development to create a civic space that might have underground parking, massive underground parking, that could be used both by the state and, and others, but would really begin to put kind of the front welcome mat between the Capitol and, and Congress. I think it's also a place for a great international design competition of which we already pulled off one in, in Austin. I think we could do number two. This just goes back and, and again speaks to what I've, I've talked about before. Uh, design the street as a, as a system and as a collection of systems and understand in this outdoor room, 
how the different systems have to work, have to work together. It's a pretty simple idea. It's very difficult to, to pull off. Um, uh, we are beginning to understand and have a, under, under a, uh, way right now a inventory um, by Howard and, and his staff to really, think, really understand what is actually in that street from an infrastructure point of view. That will give us a basis for beginning to think about what really can be done out there. I think that the third point is something I really want to stress. If you're going to build great cities, you have to understand that there are times when you make mistakes. And some of those mistakes then become institutionalized and stick around a long, long time. If something isn't right, don't be afraid to correct it. If something isn't right, don't be afraid to correct it. In Portland, the first move that took place in the renaissance of downtown Portland was taking a freeway off the river and making a park. And that in itself was an initiative that started everybody thinking towards a greater city. I think the, the little diagram I show is something that's just more of an observation that is, that is a part of the construct of Congress right now. Uh, you get the feeling, if you look at it, that's really wide sidewalks. In reality, what it is, is that with the angled parking, is a very constricted area that goes between the parking and between the storefronts themselves. And if you watch the solicitors and those that are begging or asking for money are at the pinch points. Because as you come through that throat, you have to you have to um, pay attention to that person that's sitting there either with their hand out or with their, their pad ready for a signature. So in your next stroll around downtown, kind of watch how this operates so that that very narrow uh, sidewalk, while you might have a, a feeling that it is a wide sidewalk, is very, very constricted. And I think that is one of the areas that really needs correction. I want you to integrate the bridge. I think the bridge needs to be more than transportation infrastructure in the Batcave. I think it needs to, to be a part of, of the overall Congress construct. And I think what that means is it isn't just a bridge. It is something on either end that really begins to anchor it in, into the city, to put a function there, to put an activity there um, that really makes crossing that bridge an enjoyable experience and, and there's a reward at one end or the other. In Portland, again, going back to that experience, and I don't mean to kind of keep going back to it, but, but that uh, it's, it's an all, always a good example uh, as here. We made, uh, as we began to develop the downtown in the Willamette River that runs through Portland, if, if any of you know that, um, the downtown always treated the river as a division or divider between the downtown and the service side of the, of the city. Uh, in, uh, we started our downtown plan, we just focused on the downtown. 20 years later, we developed a central city plan that I headed up for the city, which really began to look at a larger construct of the central city and bringing the river into the city as a part of the city, a functional part of the city. I would hate to see the same thing happen here in that uh, it takes 20 years more to, to bring Lady Bird Lake into a part of the city. So as I see it, I think that the, the understanding that the South Shore, or the South, South area, as, as it turns over, as it begins, the development begins to occur over there, that that begins to be looked at as an extension of the downtown, not as a separate area. And I would be very, very careful about instituting any kind of, of zoning, height regulations, a predetermined situation that, it, it, um, uh, that, that would constrict what it potentially could be. I want to use two examples within Portland to do this. In the Pearl District, which was in our industrial area that, that developed to the north, north of the downtown, 
when we originally went in there, we put kind of a cap in that area of about six stories. Because there was this idea, well, we want this real urban, high density place. Well, that lasted about three years. And then we realized that we weren't answering to the market, we weren't answering to the real urban feel of what the place was. We really needed a diversity in buildings, a diversity in building size heights. So we changed it and immediately moved, uh, took out the height limitation, and now we have, we have buildings that are uh, all the way from two story up to, up to 20 stories. Another place in south, the south waterfront of Portland, uh, it's the same kind of thinking, that you're on water, you have these great views. What you want to do is maximize your economic return in those areas. So we have a, a, a situation there where we're building higher rise buildings and still developing a very walkable, usable community at the base of those buildings with, with, with lower buildings. Don't make the mistake of predetermining the future. Give it guidance, but don't regulate it. And the last thing I would say is I really want a, uh, I re really suggest that we develop a tag for the corridor. Now those of you that were around Waller Creek understand what, what this is, it's a technical advisory group. It is getting folks from different um, uh, departments with, within the city all to uh, work and focus on a certain area. I think Congress is one of these areas where we should uh, work with the city. Mark was, uh, did this for us on, on Waller Creek uh, to create a tag that could really begin to help the development, but could focus on it. This could also begin to affect the amount of time for entitlements, um, but it also would give the ability to have really talented folks that are within the city, which I, I really believe, work together and focus on a particular area. I think it gives certainty and timely decisions and establishes an advocacy group uh, as well, I think, to develop better urban design. Those of you in the, in the, in the um, Gordon, others that worked on the, the tag, I think understand how, the, how this works and how all of a sudden you can, the walls come down, the silos come down, and you begin to think about, well, if I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm working on the sewer system, that's going to have an impact on what happens on the surface and the transportation system, et cetera, et cetera. And it gives everybody better guidance. So creating a tag. So from this, then uh, I, I think the future directions are these. I think the momentum that started needs to continue. And that, that will. I think with the energy in this room and the, and the people I spoke to, that is inevitable. Think about the connections and connectivity across the downtown. Uh, that this isn't just one street, but this is one street that is part of the moving parts of the downtown. Partnerships are essential. They need to be made. I want you to subscribe to the collective we, not the me. You all can make this a great city. And the logarithmic projection, which I haven't spoken to, the end, is really up to you. How great do you want it to be? A number of years ago, two, two years ago to be exact, and I've said this to other people in the audience at different times, the population of the, the world uh, moved uh, to a point where over 50% was living in urban areas. That is kind of a momentous shift, and especially in the United States, from starting out as an agrarian population and moving to an, to an urban population. But to me, it means even more, because it means that the cities we build are really reflections of our values, of what we believe we want to pass on to future generations. And I would challenge every one of you in the room today to not think about just the main street of Texas, but think how you can contribute to leaving this legacy for future Austonians, for future Texans, and for the country as a whole. It can be a great street. It is a great street, but it will be greater.
Thank you.